Welcome to Eschatology 101. Guys, we have been climbing up in the chopper. The chopper! We've been getting a big view of the lay of the land of the biblical story in order to clarify the destination, the end of the story. That word we use for the end of the story and our view of it is called meow, meow, eschatology. So as we've been journeying through the biblical narrative, we've got this idea that what God wanted to do in the beginning, he's going to get it accomplished and, and he's going to do it both in spite and in partnership with us. That's pretty incredible. So how does this biblical story end? Well, great question, Ethan. The biblical story shows that God wants to be with his people. He wants to dwell with them. He wants to live with his people. It shows that God wants to share the table with his people. And it shows that God wants the restoration of the human family, that we indeed are family with each other and with God. God will accomplish these things. So if that's the end of the story though, and that's where things are going with Christ, how are we to make sense of where we are now? In other words, how does the future touch the present? We're gonna talk about this in more detail in a later episode. There's something that theologians have come to call inaugurated eschatology. Uh? We're gonna get into that in a little bit. This is a bit of a teaser of that idea today. Somehow the eschaton, God's end game, is already breaking into the world as we know it now. It's beginning to look a lot like Easter. Now nobody's frolicking around with eggs and bunnies and stuff like that. I don't understand where that tradition came from. Did you know that God's end game has already begun? We see that most vividly at the event that changed the world, that introduced us to gospel hope. We call it the resurrection. What exactly were the hopes of resurrection? What was this idea? What does this word mean? Well, there were three beliefs that seemed to surface throughout the Old Testament. The idea that souls or selves could be awakened from the sleep of death. The idea that the bodies would, of the dead would eventually be resuscitated. And the idea that the righteous would be raised collectively and a rebirth into a world that would succeed this one. As we will see, the contours of these three hopes merge in the resurrection hope of Jesus. When Jesus came back from the dead, was this something that people who were living the biblical story expected? You see, there were contours of hope, of something beyond the grave, all the way through the biblical narrative. Let's take a look. As Job sifts through his own dilemma in the presence of his friends, he asserts that I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand on the earth and after my skin has been destroyed yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes, I and not another. How my heart yearns within me. Job is hoping for a bodily resurrection. Hosea prophesying in a really challenging time in Israel's history talks about God planning to revive his people. He says in Hosea 6 2, after two days he will revive us, and on the third day he will restore us, that we may live in his presence. In 13 14, he says, I will deliver this people from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. Oh, death, where are your plagues? Where, oh, grave, is your destruction? It seems that Hosea is hoping for God to actually bring Israel back from even death. This is hope in a bodily resurrection. In one of the most vivid anticipations of the resurrection, Ezekiel stuck in exile, God prophesies something amazing through him. He sees corporate Israel standing up even from the grave. So here we are in Exodus 37, 11 through 14. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say, our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says, my people, 
I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and I have done it, declares the Lord. This is a dramatic scene as those bones come together later in Ezekiel's encounter with God and he gets a preview of the very real resurrection hope of Christ. We see resurrection hope laced into the prayers of God's people, the Psalms. Let's read here from the Dictionary of New Testament Background. The hope is based on confidence in God's power over death, not a view of something immortal in man. The psalmists do not reflect on what part of man survives death, his soul or his spirit, nor is there any reflection on the nature of life after death. There is merely the confidence that even death cannot destroy the reality of fellowship with the living God. Guys, this is the prayer of resurrection hope. So it's clear that the Old Testament at least anticipates the idea of something beyond the grave, that, that their lives ending wasn't the end of the story. But just how would resurrection begin? What would it look like? How would it be introduced to the world? If there was this hope of one day God's promises and his intentions being fulfilled, how is that going to happen? This coming Messiah, this person who, in whom all of their hopes had been bound, and he was nailed to a tree. He died, right? So how would God's agenda move forward in light of the death of Christ. Well, let's just say that everyone was surprised. Well, they were just as shocked as we might have been if we had visited the tomb of Christ only to find it empty. God's restorative movement coming into the world, the resurrection, this fulfillment, this hope of God's end game being realized and beginning with Christ. How did the New Testament authors, how did the early believers make sense of resurrection as it applies to us? In other words, what does the resurrection mean for our hope? Well, Paul talked about it with a helpful illustration, a metaphor. That he talked about resurrection from the perspective of a harvest. He called Jesus the first fruits. Let's take a look at his letter to the church in Corinth, a conflicted body of believers who were having issues largely focused and wrapped around their misunderstanding of God's end game. And guys, when we don't understand where God is going with things, we end up skewing the moment. Our view of the end shapes what we do now. And so Paul writes to the Corinthian church to remind them that God's end game is resurrection. That has a lot of application for how we live in the here and now, believe it or not. Let's take a look. If we lose sight of the bodily resurrection, it has serious consequences about what we think how Christian living should work. Believe me, this is what Paul is arguing here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're going to look at verses 12 through 19. But tell me this, since we preach that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you saying there will be no resurrection of the dead? For if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. And we apostles would be all lying about God, for we have said that God raised Christ from the grave. But that can't be true if there's no resurrection of the dead. Then your faith is useless, and you are still guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. Paul goes on through verse 23, But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. So, you see, just as death came into the world through a man, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man. Just as everyone dies because we belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. 
but there is an order to this resurrection. Christ was raised as the first of the harvest. Then all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. So this idea of first fruits, do you guys know what a first fruit is? Well, it's, it's pretty self-explanatory, I guess. It's the first fruit of the harvest. Now, if you were to go outside, let's just say you're in tropical climate, right? And you reach outside and there's a lemon tree and there's like one or two lemons on there and you pick those lemons off. Mmm, lemon. I don't know if anybody just eats a lemon, but let's say you're gonna make some lemonade, right? You take those lemons inside and you're like, great, this is cool, but I don't really have enough to make lemonade yet. And I'm waiting for this tree to finish a, a second batch of fruit, right? Is it just the first fruits? Is it the early buds? You're going to have to wait. But when you do wait and you wait for those lemons to grow, you're not going to walk out there and one day pick an orange or a grape or a hamburger. Sidebar, wouldn't a hamburger tree be really awesome? Okay, back to the point. Right? That tree, that lemon tree, it grows lemons. So a first fruit is going to be an indicator of what the rest of the fruit are. If Jesus came back from death in a bodily resurrection, right? He didn't just get zapped up and become an angel with, uh, with wings and a harp on a cloud. You know, Thomas felt his scars, scars. He had a corporal form. He was physical. He was in a bodily resurrection then that means our hope is just as solid as Christ's because Christ is the first fruit of the resurrection. And here's the part where things get a little crazy and in a good way. Because Jesus rose from the dead and his resurrection happened already, that means that future hope is present in Christ. This means that for biblical eschatology, guys, the future is present now. Oh my goodness. You see, the hope we have about the resurrection isn't just something that's on the horizon. Yes, we're going to be talking about this in our, in our talk on inaugurated eschatology. There is a kingdom already and a kingdom not yet right? And their intention with one another. N.T. Wright writes about this eschatological tension. He says, belief in the bodily resurrection includes the belief that what is done in the present, in the body, by the power of the Spirit will be reaffirmed in the eventual future in ways at which we can presently only guess. Because we believe we're already saved through Christ, but that salvation has not come to total fruition right? Because we are not in the new heavens and the new earth. So this tension, I want you to hear this with hope that the resurrection is somehow playing out among us right now. So here's what this means. Because they are already joined to Christ, believers actually begin to experience resurrection existence here and now. And because the resurrection means so much for our future, our present, is so important. The resurrection has implications for how we live in the here and now. What you do with your life, with your decisions, with your body, it all matters. It is a way to lean into the direction God is going in this incredible story. Let's put it this way. You guys know the Lord's Prayer. Can you feel the eschatological tension? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Part of how we live our lives here and now is previewing God's fullness of the resurrection and the new heavens and the new earth in the here and now. So guys, maybe the best way for us to sit in this tension as, as we think about the first fruits and the, and the preview of what's to come that we get through the resurrection of Christ and how he's a first fruit and how our hope is shaped after the life and the resurrection of Christ. Maybe it, it becomes best to summarize this tension by using some words from one of our youth volunteers, uh, Bible scholar grandparent, the late Roger Decker. He said that the kingdom of heaven is here, coming and participatory. So guys, as we think about the resurrection hope that is on the horizon, let us realize that that hope touches the present. What happened to Christ 
those who are in him, will happen to us. One day, there will be a bodily resurrection of those in Christ. On that day, we will join with Christ. We will be with God and his end game. All the things we're hoping for, seeing God's intentions played out in human history, they will come to fruition. The harvest will be here. Guys, I hope this has been helpful. I hope this has encouraged you and given you hope. Our hope is as concrete as the bodily resurrection of Christ. May that be something you carry in your hearts and your behavior and the way that you think about your own future. Realize that God is working in human history to bring about this amazing harvest. Be stirred to hope. And guys, next week we'll dive into this concept of inaugurated eschatology, this tension between the world coming and the world already, this tension between the kingdom already and how it's playing out in our lives in the present and how it is shaping us and preparing us for the kingdom come. I can't wait to dive into that with you. And until then, Godspeed.